Okay. Okay, hello everyone. This is Nabila from CTRL. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you, if you want close, if you want captioning, we do have the option. You should see it at the bottom of your screen. That's called show subtitles. If you don't see it, please click on more, and you should see that option. At the end of the presentation, we do have a survey. We will provide you with the QR code or with the link. Um, and then please just scan it and give us your feedback. We certainly appreciate it and it helps us improve our programs. Uh, moving on to the presenters, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Nabila. Um, and hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Martin Oliver. I'm the faculty chair of the AU Corps. Um, and I, I'm glad that you all have uh, joined us today to, to talk about um, uh, case studies as an assessment mechanism for uh, uh, for the core, uh, generally speaking, but I think also for um, for all sorts of work that we do. Um, I, I wanted to take a minute to sort of talk about um, what it is that we're doing in core when it comes to assessment um, and to kind of frame like how did we get to this question of uh, or this this tool of using uh, case studies as a mechanism for assessment. Uh, you know, I, I, I recognize that assessment is in some circles um, uh, not the most pleasant word when people are like, oh, you have to do assessment, right? And and the way that we've been trying to frame it uh, in the core, we've spent uh, a whole bunch of years building this brand new general education curriculum that uh, represents a real shift away from the old gen ed program and, and uh, towards this new inquiry-based uh, uh, liberal arts uh, curriculum, um, and the problem there is that, or the problem, the 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 glory there, the glory, the the uh, advantage with this change is that we moved away from a content uh, specific kind of general ed program where it's like you got to know a lot of stuff uh, to what we call an inquiry based uh, program, which is about like how you ask questions, how you engage with the stuff of the world, right? And this radically changed the learning outcomes for all parts of the core and all parts of our general education curriculum. Um, but it does raise some questions for like, okay, well, how do we know, right? Like if it's one thing, if like we're asking students to like know the basics of biology, right? Like that's, you can test that with a sort of content focused sort of examination or if, uh, for art history, if it's like, yeah, you like memorize a bunch of slides, but that's not what we're interested in anymore. We're interested in how we ask questions and how we engage with the material of the world. And uh, ethical reasoning, I think, presents certain uh, particular kinds of challenges for this sort of thing. And as you'll see, the learning outcomes that were developed for ethical reasoning um, pose some some real challenges to wonder, like, are students getting this? Are they are they understanding how it is to ask ethical, ethical questions, right? What does it mean to engage in ethical reasoning? And how would we, right, as the stewards of the program, how would we know that this is happening? Um, so assessment generally, and I think we can move to the next slide, Diamond. Um, assessment generally for, for CORE has been a, a, a pretty big um, challenge, and we've developed, I think, a really robust framework. Um, as, as this says here, we've got a, a three-year cycle, um, and we work really hard to move through each element of the CORE. Um, and I'm happy, that I, I'm sort of assuming here that most of us are familiar with what the CORE is, so I won't give an overview of it. Um, but uh, we're thinking uh, really deeply about uh, the courses that are offered in the core, right? Um, like, what does the syllabus look like? How does the uh, teaching happen in that course? What sorts of assignments are given? Um, how do those assignments get at the learning outcomes for that particular area of the core? And then what is the student work, right? Like, what kinds of work are the student producing? And how does that illustrate their um, engagement with those learning outcomes, their ability to illustrate sort of knowledge or uh, facility with those learning outcomes and how do we do it? Um, so we've got a, a sort of a three-year cycle that we hope is kind of repeatable for all this. But I think the other thing is that there is no uh, uniform assessment mechanism for the entirety of the core. Ethical reasoning um, has a particular set of learning outcomes and a particular set of objectives, and they need a particular set of tools in order to ask, are the students getting the things that we hope that they get? Right. And it's the same thing with natural scientific inquiry, with social historical inquiry. Each of the areas of the core, uh, diversity and equity, uh, the the writing, um, writing the disciplines uh, courses, um, they all have uh, part, need to approach the their uh, assessment practices with um, 
I, I think, sort of unique angles and unique tools. Nevertheless, we try to share what we learn with a, 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 um, an assessment across all of the subcommittees that constitute the core. Um, and and what ethical reasoning and many of the, the subcommittee members are here today, and I'll, um, I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves uh, in just a minute. Um, uh, what they what they decided for or decided on the last year and a half is like maybe a an, a, a case study would give us an opportunity to investigate these learning outcomes across the wide spectrum of courses that makes up ethical reasoning. Right, ethical reasoning happens in lots of different places across the university, from Kogat School of Business to the College of Arts and Sciences to uh, SPA, right? Um, school Communications. I think there's ethical reasoning uh, course in just about every uh, college on campus, um, and that means that there's lots of different ways to do it. So it's like, how do you ask, ask, uh, ask, and get good data on whether or not the students are attaining uh, those learning outcomes that we've set out for them? So the case study was the um, was the choice uh, of our subcommittee, and we've uh, gone to run some. Uh, some sort of trials on that to be like, hey, is this going to work as, as a way to think about it? But we also recognized that uh, the case study approach might be a really interesting um, tool that could be applied in lots of different places, right? And so some of our hope today is to sort of think about case studies as assessment mechanisms um, to share with you our sort of process in developing that and what it looked like, uh, why we're doing it, and uh, and then to kind of explore the um, ramifications of all of that and uh, if it might be a, a valuable tool uh, in other kinds of places or if we I think we're also thinking about you know how can we tweak this uh, approach to assessment using case studies that that is most effective and so we'll invite everybody to kind of talk about that. Um, I think uh, I'm going to turn it over to um, my colleagues. I'll, I'll start with Diamond Brown who is the uh, assessment analyst for CORE um, and has worked really closely with all of the CORE subcommittees on our assessment work. Um, I'll let her introduce herself and then we can move to the ethical reasoning subcommittee uh, who's here and, and we'll kind of take it from there. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Diamond Brown. I am the assessment analyst for here. I'll turn it over to Lauren. Who's got the uh, controls for the PowerPoint? Okay, good. Do you want me to jump to the next slide? Yeah, sorry. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. And uh, before I start, I want to recognize a couple other members of the Ethical Reasoning Committee who are here today who helped to develop this exercise. We've got um, Chris Utter. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, Chris Utter. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Government, and um, I've been on the Ethical Reasoning Subcommittee for about two years at this point, I think. Um, yes, and, and uh, uh, th this has been, I think, so far a very successful uh, technique that we've developed, so I'm looking forward to our discussion. <laughs> And Katie Hutt from the library. Hi, yes, I'm Katie Hutt. I'm the business and econ librarian. I've been on the ethical reasoning habits of mind committee. I think it's been three years. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to uh, move forward with this and, and hear about what, what everyone is going to say today. So um, before I tell you about the uh, process that we went through and the, the activity that we developed, I'll talk a little bit about what ethical reasoning is. So as Martin mentioned, um, this is a AU core requirement that's part of um, a group of five types of courses that we call habits of mind. And these are course requirements that students are required to complete as part of the AU core. But many of these courses also count for department credit for majors and minors. So one of the things that's tricky as an instructor in teaching these courses is that you're often juggling two sets of learning outcomes. So I teach a couple of different ethical reasoning courses in philosophy, and I've got a set of ethical reasoning learning outcomes and philosophy learning outcomes. And I wanna be very clear that this assessment exercise is strictly 
focused on the AU core learning outcomes. So we're not doing anything um, involving faculty evaluation. Um, we're, we're not even evaluating all of the learning outcomes for this exercise. We're gonna be looking at one of the four ethical reasoning learning outcomes. So now I'll talk a little bit about what those are. Can we move to the next slide? Um, oh, one more uh, slide, there we go. Um, Martin already summarized what I was, had in the previous slide, which was a whole lot of different departments that are teaching ethical re reasoning um, courses with these common learning outcomes. One is to identify and differentiate ethical perspectives or questions. So there's a lot of focus on inquiry. Two is demonstrate ethical awareness by critically discussing and analyzing moral presuppositions. So this is a really mixed one. Um, we're looking both at the students' own moral presuppositions that they bring into the classroom, but also the moral presuppositions that are involved in the course materials, in narratives that students evaluate, in um, arguments that they evaluate, in discussions. Um, third is recognize the origins or structures of complex ethical issues. And this is the one that we chose to focus on for our first assessment activity. And four is apply ethical concepts and frameworks. And that is one that we have so much discussion and debate about just among the committee. What do we mean when we're talking about ethical concepts and frameworks? What counts as an ethical concept? How do we differentiate an ethical concept from an ethical framework, et cetera? Okay, next slide. All right, so a little bit of background about these case studies. So this is actually connected to a broad, a broader program that AU has run for a number of years. And this is something that was started by um, one of our colleagues, Ellen Feeder, who um, teaches in philosophy and religion with, with me, but also um, was the original chair of the Ethical Reasoning Committee and worked very closely with um, the AU core committee that was developing the core in um, uh, clarifying the learning outcomes for ethical reasoning. So in 2012, AU was approached by um, a group from um, the Parr Center for Ethics at UNC Chapel Hill, who were trying to bring together people from across the country to start something called the National High School Ethics Bowl. An ethics bowl is something that has existed at the collegiate level for about 40 years, uh, but it's an activity similar to debate where students discuss case studies, but instead of debating um, and trying to win an argument, the focus is on promoting ethical dialogue. Um, and so we sponsor at AU every year, the DC regional competition for high school students. So we usually have about 150 to 200 high school students a year who come to AU to participate in a tournament to discuss ethical case studies. Um, these work really well for this kind of assessment exercise because they're very short and focused. And so the committee reviewed a number of different case studies as options for this exercise before we decided on this case study. So this case study is uh, used with permission. Um, it was part of the 2019-2020 uh, regional case set, which is a set of about 15 cases that the National High School Ethics Bowl distributes nationally uh, as a common case set for students across the country to discuss. And this is one that, um, as I've used this as an exercise over the years with different groups of students, inspired an incredible amount of interest and discussion among students. So we thought it would be a promising case for this activity. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what we're gonna do to start us off today is we're gonna read through the case study. We're gonna read through it twice. And then we have some discussion questions. So we're gonna go through all that together. And then we're gonna put you into, I think we have enough folks to do some small breakout rooms and have you practice the, the discussion so you can experience what the students went through. And then we'll come back and talk about our assessment approach to the data that we collected from students participating in this activity. So I'm gonna read through it twice. Um, if you've got the capacity to do so, feel free to jot down notes as we go through it. And then we're gonna go through um, a set of three questions that we're gonna focus on. 
Okay, so um, this is a fictionalized case study, but um, I think in the law and order tradition, we can say it's one that was ripped from the headlines. There were some very controversial, um, similar examples in the press. Okay, so Mallory and Ross are to be married this summer. Both grew up in the South and can trace their family lineages to wealthy plantation owners in pre-Civil War North Carolina. Although the couple takes little pride in their respective family's history, their immediate family members take their heritage very seriously. In fact, Ross's family has offered to pay for the entire wedding on the condition that they hold the wedding on a plantation turned wedding venue that used to belong to one of their ancestors. This, his family claims, would be a way of celebrating the two families' Southern heritage while celebrating their union. Mallory and Ross are conflicted. On the one hand, the venue is objectively beautiful. In fact, it's the most beautiful venue that the couple has seen in their planning efforts for the wedding. And by agreeing to have the wedding on the plantation, they would be doing two things that would make their lives much easier. First, they would make their family members very happy. And second, they could have a lavish and memorable wedding without spending a dime. Were they to refuse, many, though not all, of their family members would be upset at their decision and take it as a personal affront and a repudiation of their shared identity. They would have to settle for a less beautiful location for the wedding and would, of course, need to foot the bill without the help of their families. On the other hand, it is highly likely that the ancestor who owned the property also owned slaves in which case the plantation they would be getting married on contributed to the institution of slavery and to the suffering of many people. They want their marriage to be a happy occasion and don't want to begin their new life together on a site of past cruelty and racism. Even on the off chance that this particular plantation never had slaves, Mallory and Ross feel that the association between Southern plantations and slavery is significant enough to potentially put a damper on their wedding day. Okay, so I also want to mention that when the students did this as an assessment activity, they did not have a chance to review the case in advance, which is why we started every session with giving them a paper copy and encouraging them to take notes and annotate and reading through it twice together. Okay, so for the second time, Mallory and Ross are to be married this summer. Both grew up in the South and can trace their family lineages to wealthy plantation owners in pre-Civil War North Carolina. Although the couple takes little pride in their respective family's history, their immediate family members take their heritage very seriously. In fact, Ross's family has offered to pay for the entire wedding on the condition that they hold the wedding on a plantation turned wedding venue that used to belong to one of their ancestors. This, his family claims, would be a way of celebrating the two families' Southern heritage while celebrating their union. Mallory and Ross are conflicted. On the one hand, the venue is objectively beautiful. In fact, it's the most beautiful venue that the couple has seen in their planning efforts for the wedding. And by agreeing to have the wedding on the plantation, they would be doing two things that would make their lives much easier. First, they would make their family members very happy. And second, they could have a lavish and memorable wedding without spending a dime. Were they to refuse, many, though not all of their family members would be upset at their decision and take it as a personal affront and a repudiation of their shared identity. They would have to settle for a less beautiful location for the wedding and would of course need to foot the bill without the help of their families. On the other hand, it is highly likely that the ancestor who owned the property also owned slaves, in which case the plantation they would be getting married on contribute to the institution of slavery and to the suffering of many people. They want their marriage to be a happy occasion and don't want to begin their new life together on a site of past cruelty and racism. Even on the off chance that this particular plantation never had slaves, Mallory and Ross feel that the association between Southern plantations and slavery is significant enough to potentially put a damper on their wedding day. Okay, so that is the text of the case. And then we gave the students some discussion questions. 
These were not the original discussion questions that came with the case. We wrote these questions specifically for the assessment activity to focus on learning outcome three. So we asked the students to identify and discuss the various layers of ethical dilemmas presented in the scenario and asked how might these layers complicate the decision-making process. We asked them to explore the different perspectives involved in the scenario, including those of Mallory, Ross, their families, and potential wedding guests. How do these diverse perspectives further complicate the ethical issues at hand, and how might they influence the decision-making process? And third, we asked them to consider the historical and cultural origins that contribute to the ethical complexity of Mallory and Ross's decision regarding the wedding venue. And we asked them to think about how these origins shape the ethical considerations involved. Okay, so um, let's put the slide. Um, I'm actually rethinking the breakout groups. I think we have a small enough group that we can um, stay together considering that some of us have seen the case many times. Um, so let's put the, um, the slide back up with the case in case people want to reference it because that is something that was pretty important in the student discussion. Um, one of the things that um, the students across all of the courses noticed and some were quite frustrated with is that the case is purposely ambiguous. So we're asking them to consider questions when they don't have all of the information. Um, so let's invite our participants here to share some observations about the case before we get into the specifics of the discussion questions. Is there anything that you um, that you notice about the case or uh, questions that occur to you based on reading through the case? And feel free to um, use your uh, reaction buttons or to just jump in since we're a small group. And members of the committee, if you if you recall our discussion of this case, feel free to chime in as well. What do we know about Mallory and Ross so far from the case? Uh, before you jump in, Chris, oh, someone oh, sure. in the chat. Sorry, um, someone in the chat said, "Do Mallory and Ross still oh, live in the South? Um, what impact would this have on their life the, beyond the wedding?" Chris, feel free to jump in now. Right. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question. I guess what I was going to um, point out is that, uh, and I think we we brought this up in our initial uh, discussion. It might be implied that um, Mallory and Ross are are both white, but we don't. I don't think we actually know that, which might complicate things. Of course. Right. We know that they have some sort of a shared identity and that their two families share um, Southern heritage, right? We don't know um, whether they still live in the South. We don't actually even know if they ever lived in the South. Their family heritage is, is Southern, but we don't know where they were raised. Um, we also don't know, um, as Danielle pointed out um, in the chat, we don't know their financial status. Uh, we don't know their um, racial identity. And um, right, we don't know anything about their class origin um, or background, um, which could 
throw some interesting power dynamics into um, the negotiations. Um, so what do we know about them? We know less than what we don't know. There are a lot of things we don't know about them. We know that they have shared Southern heritage. What do we know about their connection, their family connection to this particular property? Allison. I think this is what you're asking, but I was I was sort of focused on thinking about the identity questions here that seem to come up for for both um for both Mallory and Ross that make them diff things that make them different from their parents. And I kind of I appreciate how the case study kind of taps into something that our students probably are experiencing at this moment as well, which is like I'm now noticing some of the things that make me different from my parents or things that make me um, that maybe I believed that now I'm starting to question and I now recognize that that came from my parents and that's there's a there's a discomfort with that. I mean, I, I think that's interesting that this taps into that. It seems like one of the questions that Mallory and Ross have to deal with is the extent to which they're willing, you know, they 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 see themselves and want to continue seeing themselves as different from their parents in this in this um, connection to a Southern heritage that they don't really relate to, but their parents do. That was a question that came up a lot in the discussions with the students also about their friends, right? That they've got these pressures from their family, but we also have to consider how they want to involve other important people in their life in this important moment in their life and how that creates tensions. Um, and Wade also notes um, in the chat that we don't know much about the status of their existing relationships with their families, right? Whether there's already tension and how much is invested in this particular moment. Um, Danielle also uh, brings up in the chat, um, raises the question, who are the people who would not be upset if they refuse the venue, right? Um, and that was one of the things that students said, well, their friends might actually be impressed if they refuse the venue. Um, and would maybe refuse to come if they did hold it at the venue. So a lot of questions about relationships. Um, yeah, David, that's a great point. David says in the chat, it's an extraordinary moment when one suddenly appreciates a received tradition differently from one's parents. Okay. Um, can we uh, move to the next slide? Let's look at the discussion questions in particular. Can we jump in quickly? Sure, go ahead, David. I'm just struck by a memory that recently my one of my daughters uh, was talking about a wedding in the South involving a relative of a relative, and it was going to be in some context like this, and they were all debating the appropriateness of attending and what it all means, whether it reflects divisions in the family, so it was quite extraordinary. Thank you. Yeah, and many of the students noted that um, there were some famous pop stars who very publicly wrestled with this same, same question. So um, that was another reason that we chose this case because it was already a topic of discussion among um, their generation. Okay, so um, just briefly uh, to keep us moving with the, the rest of the conversation, let's um, talk a little bit about these. So um, in the chat, um, Danielle notes um, uh, that we don't know much about their financial status, though I don't think that really matters to the ethics, right? So it's those kinds of questions that we're trying to get at in number one, like what, what are the ethical concerns that they're facing here? So we've already identified some concerns about relationships and how their decision-making affects their relations um, with their family, as well as other important people in their lives. Um, what do we think about this financial element? Does this or should it play a role uh, in their ethical reflection and ethical concerns about making this decision? I was just thinking about 
a documentary that I saw the other day where two black women purchased a, a plantation so that they could preserve its cultural and historic background and um, present these hard truths to the public. And so I thought about that in this situation. I don't think this is the case here, but one thing that came to mind taking it to an extreme level is that if the same thing has happened in Germany, Poland, where um, Jewish people have um, been given management over former concentration camps and they preserve the buildings and the structures so that people can come and see the reality of what happened. I can't imagine having a wedding at these venues. And so that's where my perspective at this moment is, why would you want to have a wedding there, taking it to this extreme with um, with Auschwitz or Birkin? That is a really interesting comparison. What's the, do you remember the name of the documentary? Well, I just, I was trying to pull it up and it is two women in Louisiana purchased a former plantation to preserve and protect black history. And uh, it's, you can Google it. It's, there's several articles, ABC News reported it. And this was in uh, 2024. Okay, look that up. Cause this was something that came up with the student discussions. Who does own this plantation? Um, does it matter who owns the plantation? Are we assuming that the plantation um, in its in its current status as an operating business is owned by white Southerners? What if it were owned by, by black Southerners? Would that make a difference? Um, Although black Southerners or black people, <clears throat> I'd imagine, would never turn it to a wedding venue. I haven't seen it. Right. Katie. I was just um, thinking about the financial question. Um, I think you could sort of like posit it so it, it could matter ethically, like if they, if both of them work in areas of, uh, you know, anti, anti-racist anti areas, that's their job and they would have to quit their jobs and do something else in order to pay for the wedding, right? Something like that. I mean, it's, it's an extreme. I think it's taking it to extreme um, or if paying for the wedding would then put them into, into debt something like that you could take it to an extreme so that the financial situation it would come into play i was just thinking of some scenarios well and i think there's also broader questions about um out of control spending on weddings in general right that was something that the students um really related to in thinking about their own um financial futures and whether it would be something that would reflect their values if they had to pay for it themselves to go into debt in that way, um, right? Daniel says, no one needs an elaborate wedding, it's still a choice. Um, so that was another question that came up, right? Why does this matter? What What is a wedding about? Um, one of the students in my class um, talked about her own heritage that was Armenian, which has, had nothing to do with Southern heritage, but talked about how there were very particular cultural traditions and expectations that, um, made a kind of elaborate wedding mean something very different than just a, you know, a display of conspicuous consumption. And what kind of ethical questions does that raise? Um, okay, so I think we've already um, addressed in certain ways question two, the different perspectives involved in this scenario. Are there other perspectives that we might consider? I would just like to add one quick thing. I'm I'm Osage, and if white people, for instance, owned an area, say, where Wounded Knee or uh, land that we own or did own, and tragedy happened there, and someone wanted to conduct a celebration unrelated to our survival or along those lines, our tribe would find it very offensive. Yeah, and that brings up layers of ethical consideration, right? We have the the um, the interpersonal 
concerns related to their families and their family history. But there's a broader social ethical question here as well. Not just should they do this, but should this be practiced at all? And if we decide no, then what ought to be the response? Wade. Just to say a little bit more about the perspectives and this is not all for me because I ran this exercise. And so some of this are things that my students brought up, but uh, they focused a lot on the perspective of the guests coming, right? And how that might affect different people attending the wedding differently. And they spent a lot of time thinking about if you're in this situation, is there a way to use those perspectives to make it more acceptable? Um, it, 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 this kind of like touches on a number of the questions. So just shut me up if I ramble too much. But um, <clears throat> considering the venue, though, they, they talked about, you know, with if you have diverse people coming to your wedding with different backgrounds could you set up something on the side as an activity from the wedding to explore the history of the the plantation should that be mandatory for all the guests um something that came up for, uh, back from like mallory and ross's perspectives is what could they do if they had wedding savings that they didn't now have to spend because of the um of the families paying for it and could that be put towards some good use so even even like their own perspective could be used to try to not pervert but to sort of twist this the the dilemma presented by this benefit into something good potentially but uh but no i think i think the the, the the families we we we've kind of covered the unknowns and Mallory and Ross and their am, uh, apparent ambivalence from the uh, the prompt, but the the wedding guests I think were the biggest unknown. Like what are their what's their friend group like? And the last thing I'll say is just sort of touching on that too. Uh, a number of students you know spoke about being from the south. And that um, sometimes it's hard to, you know, sometimes you live in a place where you can't throw a stone without hitting something that was involved in um, in the Civil War or in antebellum U.S. One of them spoke about, uh, a student of color spoke about growing up around Manassas, right? And that those battlefields where great tragedy happened were where they walk their dog and it's now akin to parkland and yes bad things happened uh but um growing up there you your perspective is completely different on because it's everywhere anyway yeah that kind of reminds me of land acknowledgments which you know kind of superficial apologies because the land's not going to be given back. Sorry, we're on your land, but they, we want to acknowledge you. You know, so I don't know. I, I see what you're saying, but I don't know if there is a way to put a ribbon on this and make it nice. And I know there's been some controversy too. A lot of universities formerly used slaves and so does that mean those are those universities aren't acceptable to go to today? And it's not a, it's not an exact comparison, but it is something I think to factor in. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to suggest that that um, the, the the putting on a ribbon on it makes it all okay, but but in thinking of the ethical considerations. Um, I mean, I I, th I think the the point about okay, what if Mallory and Ross have some sort of savings uh, put aside for this wedding and not having to pay for it, they put all of it towards increased um, awareness or an education program about what was going on, or 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 even towards creating a program at the plantation if one doesn't already exist to show what reality was like or life from the perspective of the slaves. Um, that 
you know, it definitely, we haven't talked about this, but it definitely fits into certain frameworks of ethical reasoning about like, can we do greater, can we bring good out of this in such a way that it, um, it from a sort of quantitative perspective, exceeds the, the damage that would be caused by doing it? Um, yeah, I like that activist approach. And to Danielle's question, I think if we really had integrity, we wouldn't go to universities that are on stolen land. And I think that's one of the things that was was most interesting to me in observing students, different groups of students talking through this prompt was grappling with the fact that they, many of them started from a position of almost sort of reactionary certainty. No, this is wrong. They cannot do this. Um, and then grappling with their frustration about what information was not provided in the prompt really pushed them to uh, have, have a, an honest dialogue about what makes this question so complicated, right? What are what are all of the the, the layers? Um, and interestingly, every time I participate in or observe this conversation, I hear somebody bring up another layer or another question that I've never heard before. Um, and so that's part of what we were trying to look at when we we as a committee. Um, worked through, I think probably the most challenging part of designing this exercise, which was coming up with some sort of a rubric to try to identify what do we wanna see the students achieving? Um, how does that look different in uh, a participatory exercise than in an individual reflection, right? We talked about, sh should we just, give them a reflection prompt and have them write a short essay. Um, and there's something about the richness of this kind of conversation that we felt couldn't really be captured in a, a one-off written response. Um, so at this point, our process is that we've collected um, a bunch of audio recordings of different groups of students who have discussed this case together. And we're gonna generate transcripts of those and go through them and see what we see based on a rubric that we put together. That is definitely a work in progress. Can we um, put the slides back up for a second and we'll, we'll show you what we were thinking on that. And then we're really interested in, in feedback on this because this, this is very much, um, a an experiment. Um, Lauren, do you want the slide or the rubric slide up? Let's go. Did I put this one first? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then let's do this one first. Um. So, um, one thing that we talked about is what what are we trying to assess when we're assessing habits of mind? What are we even talking about when we talk about habits of mind? Um. This is a concept that is not new to our general education revision. Um, it's a concept that has been developed over a number of decades in a community of researchers and scholars who are thinking about so-called critical thinking. Um, so the habits of mind approach, if you Google it, you'll, you'll find organizations devoted to habits of mind who lay out um, different articulations of what developing sort of critical thinking habits of mind look like. Here's some examples, but our approach as a university to taking on this framework for AU core was not wedded to those existing um, uh, articulations of what successful habits of mind look like. Um, so these are just some examples. So things that we might look for in um, assessing whether students have developed a habit of mind in, in a way of thinking. So what, what kind of clarity of expression um, are, are they able to develop? 
um, particularly for a discussion uh, format, um, asking those kinds of clarifying questions in dialogue, um, I think will prove really important for our assessment of ethical reasoning. Um, but clarifying terms, right? Making sure that that everyone is on the same page, so to speak. Uh, and, and then is their discussion coherent? Um, are they able to summarize their, their points in a way that their, um, their colleagues in the class can understand? Is the discussion organized? Is it, is it structured? Um, and this is actually something that's kind of interesting to see in a classroom setting with a group of students who have been together across an entire semester. Um, are they um, approaching the, the, the prompt and the discussion questions in a way that's driven by inquiry? Are they um, you know, questioning? And in this, with this case, we definitely saw this, that they were really questioning um, assumptions that were, they were making based on evidence that was in the case and evidence that was definitely not in the case. Uh, how open-minded are they in dialogue? Are they con truly considering one another's views rather than uh, you know, debating and, and trying to win points? Um, are they accurate in the sense that they're actually referencing what's in the text? Um, this was something that, that I saw groups of students um, use as a kind of tool to grapple with the uncertainty of the prompts, right? To say, well, okay, let's go back and see what it actually says here. What do we know and what are we not told? Um, and then um, originality, but not in the sense of coming up with an original argument, um, but an originality of approach to, to inquiry. Are they, are they um, open to kind of being pushed out of their comfort zone? Um, particularly with ethical dialogue, we get a lot of students who come in who, want, who just want the facts. Right. And are they at a point from the beginning of the semester to the end where they are more comfortable wading into the ambiguity of ethical dialogue? So with all that in mind, we put together a kind of rubric. Um, this is, again, just focused on learning outcome three, which is recognizing the origins or structures of complex ethical is issues. And as you'll note, there's ambiguity in the learning outcome itself. We don't specify what we mean by origins or structures. And in our conversations as a committee and putting this rubric together, we worked on this over months. And then we had, I would say two to three weeks of really intense discussions as we put together a draft and then revised it. And one of the things that really stood out to me was that we, needed to clarify our, our terms, that uh, we had a lot of different assumptions about what origins or structures might mean. And at first we thought that that was a problem. And then we realized that actually was probably something that we wanted the students to be able to develop, but also to identify. So we came up with three different parts to the rubric um, based on um, the discussion questions and then three levels of assessment from does not meet expectations up to exceeds expectations. Um, so we'll start with the exceeds. Um, so for identifying and discussing ethical questions and concerns, um, we hoped that students would be able to do that in a nuanced manner using specific evidence or examples, either from the case itself or from outside research. Of course, they're doing this in a, um, one-off course period. So um, they don't have an opportunity to, to do a lot of deep research, but they were able to bring in um, other examples that they were familiar with. And for uh, question two, exploring the different perspectives involved in the case, the, the different, we might call them sort of moral actors. Um, are they able to not only identify and explore the different perspectives, but discuss their implications for the decision-making process in a nuanced way? Um, so not just, oh, well, they might be concerned about what their friends think versus what their family thinks, but how does that press the ethical questions that Mallory and Ross have to grapple with? And then for question three on ethical complexity, um, this was where we were really getting into, what are we talking about when we mean, when we say origins and structures? So um, we specified things like historical and cultural details. Um, or other elements of ethical complexity, for example, their financial status. Um, 
and that they were able to do so in a nuanced way, again, using specific evidence or examples. Okay, can we go forward one more slide? So this is something that the folks on the committee haven't seen, um, but is sort of in the background of my thinking about this. Um, and this comes from um, research done by um, a faculty member in the School of Education. Um, I have an example. I don't know if this will show up on the screen, but um, ooh, there we go. Hold on. I have it. Um, this is one particular book that I've actually used in a course. It's called A Teacher's Guide um, to Philosophy for Children. And this is not stuff that's just about philosophy, but um, research outside the U.S. on thinking, on what we might call critical thinking in the U.S. In other contexts, there's research that talks about thinking skills as opposed to critical thinking. And then we actually have another colleague. So this book is, is co-written by um, Stephen Tricky, who is an educational psychologist who works on so-called thinking skills or critical thinking in relation to cognitive psychology um, and educational outcomes. Um, we also have another colleague in the School of Ed whose name is Stephen Vassallo, who uh, researches critical thinking. And um, Vassallo's approach to critical thinking is, is very interesting to me in that he has a very strong critique of the educational system appropriating a norm of critical thinking that sort of serves neoliberal interests. So he talks a lot about um, how the ed educational institutions sort of invite feedback from, um, from business leaders on what they wanna see from graduates, things along these lines. Um, so there's a lot of in interesting conversation about what are we actually talking about when we're think when we're talking about thinking um, when we casually use concepts like critical thinking? Um, so a lot of the discussion about habits of mind outside of AU core um, in the research literature uh, is focused on sort of what we might call thinking dispositions. Um, what are some dispositions, activities, behaviors that we associate with developing a kind of habit of thinking critically? Um, so some examples here, um, asking clarifying questions. So, and we saw this in the discussion transcripts, asking things like, what does this mean? What do you mean when you say that? Can you give us an example? Um, and following from that probing assumptions. So when someone makes a claim, following up with a, an invitation to explain, um, why do you think that that's the case? And as a group discussing, can we can we verify that or can can we disprove it? And if we can't, what does that mean about um, whether we accept or reject that kind of assumption? Um, probing rationales, reasons, evidence. Uh, how do we know this? Particularly for um, folks who really want to go to the facts. Um, not just can we give an example, but can we can we talk critically about um, where that evidence comes from? Um, and how that, how and why that matters. Um, questioning viewpoints and assumptions, not only the, the viewpoints and assumptions of others, but our own, right? Challenging someone to, to rephrase that. Can you say that in a different way? Can you explain what that means differently? Um, scaffolding really has a lot to do with, with context. Um, for um, group discussion, this is really important to make sure that you're using terms um, and concepts in the same way. Uh, probing implications and consequences. So what would be the implications of saying, for example, that they absolutely should not have their wedding at this venue? Um, what questions do they then need to think about beyond the question that they're struggling with here? Uh, and then evaluating, um, taking a moment as a group and, and most of the individual courses that did this exercise, so we timed them for 30 minutes of discussion in a 75 minute class session. And most of the groups wanted to talk more about the case and about their discussion of the case after the timer ended, right? So um, kind of gravitating toward that self-evaluation. Okay, let's see what's on the next slide. 
Okay. Um, so this is sort of thinking about this example in relation to the bigger project of evaluating a set of not just learning outcomes for each of the individual habits of mind, but uh, a central element in our core requirements that really emphasizes meta thinking, metacognition. Um, what does it mean to assess a habits of mind course, particularly a habits of mind course that's under two different sets of learning outcomes, a departmental set of learning outcomes and an AU core set of learning outcomes. Um, and how as, uh, as an institution and as a faculty, are we grappling with this shift? Um, are we thinking at all about the gen ed learning outcomes versus the departmental learning outcomes? And in particular, what we're really, really interested in, when we started this discussion of assessing AU core several years ago um, on the core council and among the committees, um, we really talked about setting a kind of research question, right? So this is not about um, just, are we successful in getting from A to B, but how can we use this assessment process to really support faculty in the core? Um, but in addition, we really wanted to bring students in, into the process of assessment. And um, one of the things that, that I did not anticipate when we put this exercise together, but that I think really um, emerged from the student conversations was that this brings students into the assessment process, both the students in the courses and the core leaders. We chose the courses that we, we invited to participate in this sort of beta test of this exercise because they had core leaders. And we invited the core leaders to facilitate the discussions and we got some really interesting feedback from uh, that emphasis. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop there. Um, very interested in your questions, your observations, feedback. Um, we're really still thinking through this at this point. It's still an experiment. Um, and if we were going to expand it, there's a lot of logistical uh, and organization questions that really raise the, the concern for me. Is it worth the additional level of work that's involved in organizing all of this, uh, working through transcripts, discussion transcripts, as opposed to just reading some student essays. So I'm very interested in, in everyone's um, observations and thoughts. I would just echo Lauren's invitation here, right? Um, we've, uh, uh, I think we're really curious about the, the uh, specific usefulness of the case study for ethical reasoning, but also thinking sort of more broadly about it, any kind of assessment that we want to do, right? There is a sort of a robustness to any of, uh, to a case study approach, but it's also a, a time and labor intensive uh, kind of thing. Um, but when we're thinking about curriculum that uh, spans the entirety of the university, right? And we're looking for a device or a mechanism to kind of get a sense of how that works um, from different disciplinary areas. The case study is sort of a, a an attractive option in that regard. So it might be um, super valuable for us, um, but but I, we, we would value anybody's uh, insider feedback on, on this as a kind of a process. I teach special education courses, and I think this would fit very nicely in having discussions about students who are denied services and that kind of thing. Um, the only piece I was thinking about that might need to be added is interpersonal communication skills, like, you know, teaching our teachers how to paraphrase back and actively listen. And that, because I can see these conversations getting very heated and perhaps even divisive. And so teaching them the skills to you know, internalized information without coming across as uh, aggressive or um, argumentative or defensive. And not just for faculty, particularly for having student core leaders facilitate these conversations. That's a really important point that we hadn't considered. It's interesting. I mean, I think the one thing that worked well with the core leaders is that they knew these students. 
they'd been with them all semester. Um, and one thing that I've seen with my own core leaders is that students gravitate to them rather than coming to me. So they become a kind of mediator of a lot of communication in a way that I think, um, I don't know, I think it's good. I also kind of mourn it because I think it's it's part of students not using office hours as much. Um, uh, okay, so Catherine asks, in terms of weighing the cost and benefits of the case study approach, what were the instructor's perspectives um, and the students? Um, so let's start with the instructors. Uh, Wayne, I'm going to put this back to you since you uh, tried it in your class. Uh, just the instructor or both mine and what I thought the students took from it? Uh, let's start with instructor. Then we'll okay. go um, <clears throat> It's very, so I did this in my neuroethics section, which is 15 student discussion based course. So the interpersonal communications things that Gail brought up, right, we'd already kind of established in the first couple of weeks how to have a respectful uh, debate with each other. And we did this uh, every week of the semester. So at least for this particular course that that worked out really well, you know, the students maintained a very civil discussion and a lot of them brought up you know some viewpoints that you might think people would be very nervous to bring up in open company right and and they still managed to you know discuss it well so from the from the instructor perspective uh there was not a lot of stepping in that i had to do i could see if you tried to drop this into say like a natural scientific inquiry course that's very you know content based and um and, and they hadn't had those kinds of debates that a lot more prep might have to be done with the students um, for it to not get heated. Uh, having having done a similar kind of debate on uh, opioid uh, use disorder and things in one of those courses that did get heated, yeah, I think it, prep would be good for those. Um, the, the, the main thing for me, from my perspective was, I facilitate discussions throughout the semester, right? And uh, when when somebody needs to play, you know, devil's advocate and bring up a viewpoint, be like, "Have you considered this?" And, uh, I do that constantly. So for me, it took a lot of restraint to not try to drive the discussion as they were having it and let it be entirely student run. Um, and it took them a few minutes to get off the ground. And, you know, they would look over at me. And at one point I was like, I'm not in this one. This is all y'all. Uh, but they really rose to the, this is, sorry, this is kind of a blend of instructor and student. Like for me, it was tough to stay out of it, but they did get on a roll. Um, and so I found myself mostly keeping time. Uh, I did kind of, I didn't, my SI could not attend a session. So uh, I did this, not SI, uh, core leader. Uh, so I, I was the facilitator and I really just kind of kept track of whose hands went up when and just said, okay, you're, you were next and you're, you're going to be next. And other than that, and, and kept the time and it was really interesting to watch, right? We've spent, we spent a whole semester trying to develop skills to discuss questions like this and to find the, find the dilemmas and, they certainly found things that I had not considered things that um, things that when we did this in committee had not come up. Um, I had to uh, another instructor perspective thing, right? Besides having to stay out of it, also to try not to like show too much reaction other than just um, other than just, you know, nodding and, and and, you know, kind of just encouraging them to keep the discussion going. I mean, there was one student who suggested, um, oh, let's go ahead and attend the wedding, but then we'll just burn the plantation to the ground afterwards. And that was really hard for me not to just crumple up into a corner uh, and try to hide my face. Um, how, how did you 
make sure everyone had a chance to speak and how did you keep time to prevent somebody from rambling on? So for each of the each of the three topics over 10 minutes uh, allotted to them and they, they were each three different questions. There was a ton of overlap, right? The students, you know, question two and question three were already being, you know, things that were relevant to those were already being discussed in the first period. So um, I would start a timer on my phone. Somebody would take it away. Whenever in this class of 15 students, there were probably five students who had a ton to say and five students who had a moderate amount to say. There were three students who only spoke once, I think, in the period, so 20% of the class. Um, whenever I saw somebody's hand go up who had not had a lot of chances to speak, I would usually, you know, getting to pick the order of like who goes next, I would usually, you know, prioritize calling on them. Um, <clears throat> I had, thankfully in this one, nobody spoke for too very long. And I had one student in class who did have a habit of speaking for extended periods of time over the course of the semester, but who was friends with another student who in this in the class who did not mind stopping them. And since I was not really actively participating in the discussion, I was grateful that their friend who was not shy took over that moderating topic for me, right? And was like, oh, so-and-so's got their hand up. Let's let's hear from them and kind of shut that other student off when the ramble was kind of like I'm doing now when when it got into ramble. Um so, um, but I, I think that's all of my instructor perspective. It was, it, given that this was an ethical reasoning topic from a course that was, you know, designed to discuss these things, it went very smoothly. That was my take. So I actually tested this with two sections in the fall, just to see how it would work before we try to roll out this semester. And notice a lot of the same things that Wade was just talking about. Um, I, you know, ha having been in the role of facilitating discussions all semester as the, the faculty member, I had to really challenge myself not to step in and prompt them or, um, you know, point them to the text, et cetera. Um, so in the spring, when I did it with my two sections, I stepped out. And I let my my uh, core leader run the discussion, and I wasn't sure how it was going to go because I had two very different classes. One was um, very boisterous, a lot of extroverts. They talked all the time. My other section was a bunch of introverts, who, as with Wade's class, there were maybe five students who would consistently talk. And I was very concerned about how that discussion would go. But my core leader said that that they actually, um, you know, the students who talked more, talked more in the discussion, but that a lot of the other students who didn't say much during class discussion actually jumped in. Um, and, and I wonder how not having prepped the material affects that. I don't know. But um, I think sometimes there's there's a disconnect between, you know, students who had time to prep the reading really carefully and students who didn't. Um, and so they were all sort of at the same starting point. Um, in terms of the actual um, logistics, one of the things that was challenging with this approach that I did not anticipate was um, connect just connecting to the recording equipment so i didn't realize that all of the classrooms that have the tech set up you can actually record so there's a camera and a microphone um which was great and made it really easy but then we have the logistical problem of making sure that all the the files record correctly and that all of the um faculty members have access to a, a laptop that can record. So um, Sarah Fringian and I, uh, who's a colleague of Diamonds in the AU core office, um, originally had planned to be at every session with either her laptop or my laptop and record to ours. Um, but then as we got 
into it a couple of times where we're like, oh, you know what, this actually isn't too hard. And, and the faculty members could do it with some instruction. So sort of just getting that, that um, down to a, a, a clear process with clear instructions, I think would go a long way, but I'm still not sure that every faculty member would be comfortable with that. So it's something that would add like an extra layer of support um, that, that uh, you know, just collecting, although I guess there's some support and Diamond, you can probably speak to this more than I can that um, not every faculty member is comfortable with like pulling their student essays from Canvas or something along those lines. Um, so with, with any kind of assessment process, they're, they're going to be logistical elements to consider. Um, so I don't have a good sense. Um, and I think we probably have to do this one more time to have more of a sense of whether it's actually a whole lot more work than collecting, you know, student written work. Um, I just have one quick follow-up question before I jump off to my next meeting. Do you, have you tried this virtually? Um, I put that option to my students mm -hmm. because it actually is much easier to generate a usable transcript to do it virtually. And they, uh, and this was last semester when I did the test, both of my classes said, no, we don't want to do it virtually. We'd like discussing together in person. We think we'll have a much better discussion. And there was there was a section of um, a, an ethical reasoning course in art history this semester that had a core leader that we thought about inviting, but it was an asynchronous online course. And I thought, I'm not ready to beta test that. I mean, it could it could work very well. I just don't, I can't imagine how we would do that. So that's that's another element to consider is um, is this a process that can actually be inclusive of all course types? Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Okay, Wade, one more comment there. Yeah, and your your audio recording came out really well. Um, um, I had a problem in my course where my um, core leader hooked it up to his laptop and somehow his Spotify started playing in the background. He couldn't hear it. He didn't realize it was playing, but about the third of the way through the discussion, music starts playing over top of the whole thing. So, you know, there are some tech things to work out, but um, it was easier than I expected it to be. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where it takes us. Um, but I think that it, for me, it raises questions about what we're doing with these habits of mind courses. Um, and like AU Core has um, been very, very attentive and respectful to each faculty committee that oversees the different habit of mind areas to give each group autonomy to develop their own assessment process. Um, so I'm hoping at some point down the line that we'll have an opportunity to take a step back and really compare um, how different approaches worked. Um, David says, in terms of assessing case study conversations, how much would be lost if students summarize their arguments on discussion boards? Right, yeah. Um, that That is exactly the question that I was thinking about in um, considering whether to include the asynchronous, or at least invite the asynchronous class. Faculty obviously had the option to participate or not. Um, I don't know. And I think part of part of the answer to that question is contingent on the functionality of the discussion boards. Wade, you want to jump in on that? Um, yeah, just to speak to that, I think <laughs> as long as we had a I I think at least for ethical reasoning, and this might not be true in all of the core disciplines, but asking them to draw a specific conclusion from the discussion might be limiting, right? And I mean, and this is part of ethical reasoning, right? And something that they may do in other course assessments. But I feel that a lot of the value of the discussion came from the fact that it's open-ended and it could be, well, have we thought about this or how, how does this play into it? But in a 30 minute discussion, coming to a concrete, here's my argument or here's what I, uh, at, at the end of it, 
I don't know how much that would reflect the students learning when the discussion is really part of the process of showing them doing the reasoning. Um, I think I think with the right questions for a discussion board might still be really useful. So uh, so I think I think there's potential value. Say if you say what what did you find most convincing? What did you find least convincing? It's not actually asking them to take up an opinion, but but to say of the discussion, you know, what resonated with you maybe and why and, and what didn't and why would give us some good information to to supplement the recordings. Yeah, and I think that if we wanted to go that way, I think it would be useful to do a deep dive into maybe some educational research literature. And, um, you know, I'm sure I'm sure that there are folks out there who have uh, perfected that or at least come much more <laughs> close than I have. Um, so there, there may be ways like uh, ways to structure um, discussion board assignments. So not, not just um, the kinds of questions that we ask, but um, how like giving students certain kinds of instructions on how to respond. Um, I don't know, maybe word counts, maybe um, elements of uh, responding back and forth to one another. Um, so I think in terms of the level of effort, that would probably require more. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it depends on um, what kinds of conclusions we come to about the process across the core, right? Because this is this is part of a broader programmatic level assessment. We're not just trying to assess, I mean, we, we are trying to assess ethical reasoning, but um, it's part of a broader set of questions about um, like looking back from where we started when we designed this core curriculum, how are things working? Is the curriculum cohering? Um, can students actually uh, carry thinking skills out of these habits of mind classes that they can apply in their other coursework and in their lives? Um, so I think we have a long way to go. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I, I, I always hated assessment before. Um, and it's, it's been through participating in these, uh, ongoing conversations about how can we think about assessment differently? That's really changed my mind about it. Um, and for me, the most important thing is focusing on how do we support faculty, particularly with the, the way that the university is, um, is trying to not say this in a negative way, how the university is allocating or not allocating resources to AU Corps. Um, one of the things that has been uh, distressing and shocking to me is to see the, the percentage of, of um, faculty resources year after year that have been sort of draining away from AU Corps. Um, so I think that if we could use this assessment process to kind of re reinvigorate faculty engagement and interest in AU Corps, that would be a good thing. Of course, then we would have to stop saying the word assessment. <laughs> um, okay. Any other uh, observations, comments? Um, before we sign off, first of all, I want to, uh, once again, thank the AU core committee members from ethical reasoning committee who joined us today. Um, thank all of our colleagues who joined us to participate in this discussion, both uh, those of you who are still here and those who had to sign off. Um, and thank our AU core colleagues, um, Martin, who had to step away for another meeting, but in particular, Sarah Fringen and Diamond Brown who, if you ever get a chance to work with these two colleagues, they are incredible, amazing, um, inspiring, and keep us going on a week-to-week -week basis with 
um, a slog with these committee assignments that <laughs> it can be really grueling sometimes. Um, and uh, they are uh, two folks who are uh, like so, so valuable to our university community. So I want to really give them a shout out. Um, yeah, Sarah says, thanks, Lauren, and everyone who joined us today. And uh, last but certainly not least, thank you to our colleagues in CGRL for organizing this. Um, Nabila, uh, in the chat, added a link. Do you want to say something about that? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. I'm just going to quickly share my screen and show you the QR code. Of course, at CTRL, we appreciate any feedback you can give us. And um, I also dropped the link in case you don't want to scan this. Uh, just click on the link. It should lead you to the survey. And thank you so much for joining. I'll just stay around, keep this up for a little bit so that you guys have a chance to scan and, of course, give us your feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nabila. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful summer. And I hope you're all finished your grading. Those of you who are grading. I think we're good. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Bye.